Good evening. You're on Visual Radio. Hello? Hello. Hey, John. Hello, it's John Phil calling. How are you? How are you? What? Can you hear me okay? Second here. Okay? Oh, great. Second here. Okay? Oh, great. Yeah. Hey, guys in the uh, production room, I'm getting a little echo in here. Yeah, there's a bit of a time delay, isn't there? Yeah, it might be the telephone. Oh, it sounds good on the air, John. So, hello. Hey, man. Thank you for calling. I appreciate the opportunity to say hi, Joe. The Winchester Star, the local paper, I just emailed you. Uh, they printed an article. Oh, really? Yeah, so they have a picture of Janice and a little talk uh, with you. Uh, me and you. But, man, it was 42 years ago. Can you believe that? Yesterday. 42 or 43 now? Two, 69, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that would make it 42. 42, yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Uh, oh, yeah? I had a computer going for a thousand years and asking it the meaning of life. <laughs> like his answer was? What? 42. 42, huh? 42. And when was that? That was the result of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, so I guess uh, we're on the right track here anyway. <laughs> so Sony sent you the Woodstock uh, box, right? Yes, I did receive that. And, and, and I'm, I'm very impressed with it. Um, but, you know, I listened to it with a, uh, with a critic's ear. And the mix they did of it is a lot more toned down for um, the older set than the bootleg, which is off the soundboard, and which is manic. It's just a manic, outrageous rock concert. Mm. And the, the Sony re-release is more smoothed out. Um, well, I guess they'd have all the technology trying to clean it up, I guess. I don't know. Right, but in summertime, there was this amazing fight between probably your guitar and the keyboard. It just sounds, it sizzles on the bootleg. And in, the, in this, it's, it's a lot more subdued. Even though you guys are still wailing, you know, they space it out, and it's cool. For, for my older ears, it, it works. Well, maybe there were different sources, Joe. Maybe one was a, a, a soundboard, a, maybe a 16-track or something like that, and the other was just a 4-track. Who knows what kind of mix they had uh, for each one. Right. Those boots are usually a 2-track soundboard that someone kind of, you know, rifled and put out on the market. Um, they had the, clearly they had the huge Woodstock 16-track, um, I guess it was. Oh, yeah, they, they would have had that. Um, but, well, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you compare past all the, the noise and, the, and the, the, the disparities in the mix, and you just listen to the music. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I do. I just think it's a tremendous performance from all of you. And uh, I've said it before, your band and the uh, Rock and Roll Animal band that Lou Reed and Alice Cooper used, two of the premier bands of the... Of the uh, well, for your band, it was the late 60s, early 70s. And for Rock and Roll Animal Band, it was the early 70s. But two just tremendous bands with, with great musicians. Yeah, uh, well, I, I really, uh, that, was, that was only my, my third job with Janice. The third time I had ever uh, uh, performed with her was Woodstock. What was the first performance? I I do believe it was the Dick Cavett show. Um, and, and then there was a Forest Hills concert, um, the tennis stadium there. And then there was, uh, that was the only one I played with Sam Andrews. And Sam says hello to you, a big warm hello, he loves you. I love that picture Sam sent me. Thank him very much for me, will you? It's a, it's, somebody snapped a, a very grainy photo of him and I on stage together at Forest Hills, and Sam sent it to me. I, I think that's wonderful. Did he mail it to you? Yeah, he emailed it to me. That's oh. I have of us together on stage. There's that, sure there's thousands of others out there, but where they are, I do not know. Sam, that is, he's a cool guy. Yeah, Sam's a nice guy. Uh, yep. you know, uh, so, you know, boy, I hope that that is on tape somewhere, Sam, Andrew, and John Till together. I don't know. Uh, the Forest Hills concert would have been that, 
and then we then there was uh, that, that was the only one except there 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 is um, the Dick Cavett show where we're both on stage together. Oh, I have that. That's that. Okay, that's great. Oh, good. I got to go look at that tonight. I do believe, but uh, there's uh, there's about three performances on the Dick Cavett show uh, of Janice. So. Uh, I'm a little fuzzy on, on whether you, that would actually be available to Sam and me, but I know that I played with uh, Sam and Cosmic Blues Band on the Dick Cavett Show, and then twice with uh, with Full Tilt on the Dick Cavett Show. They they are now putting out in about two weeks the entire Jimi Hendrix on Dick Cavett. I guess he played quite a few times. I just think it's so great that this material is made available to us. After all these years, yeah, it's like um, the Festival Express, that movie uh, about the train that went across Canada, that uh, Janice and, and, and we were all on it, and the band was on it, and, uh, and Buddy Guy, and Ian and Sylvia, you know, um, it's a fairly famous rockumentary. And Bob Seamus did it, I think? Yeah, that's the one. He did, he did the Beatles um, documentary too, right? It was wonderful that after 40 years, it all comes out. Like maybe it was only 35, but uh, those those films sat around in canisters for uh, for decades, and, and uh, it, it finally hit the streets. And we, nobody ever expected it. You just never know, do you? Was it you who told me that the canisters were used to pl as hockey goals? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You told me that. Uh, as kids, they were, they used to stack them up and use them as as, as hockey goals. And they fired so, the puck between these stacks of canisters, or big aluminum canisters of film, not knowing what was in them or whether it had any meaning at all. But they, apparently, they dragged it around from one location to another as the household moved from from one place to another. And those canisters came with them, and eventually, eventually, it uh, it got turned into a movie. Now, apparently, there's there's mo many more hours of stuff available, but I, I from that uh, from that tour, but uh, they they chose what they did, I guess because it was probably the best or something. But uh, there is other stuff for the purists out there who who, um, who might be interested. There, there might be more coming. You never know. Well, John, you know the Grateful Dead have some ridiculously large 72 CD set coming out of the entire 1972 tour. Right. <laughs> so there are people that do want the whole thing. I mean, I want the whole thing. You know I'm a big fan of yours. Um, I think that goes without saying. I'm a big fan of Full Tilt. Uh, it was an amazing group. I have a trivia question for you. On the Internet, on YouTube, there's a version of Janis Joplin solo playing me and Bobby McGee at Threadgills. Yeah. I wonder if that was done before or after the album was tracked. Well... Um, I don't know. Of course, I, I watched that. You sent me the link on that, and of course, somebody has has put that soundtrack over a totally different performance. I think it was a Dick Cavett show performance, or maybe it was. Uh, uh, I was in the background, uh, but it was some live performance of. Uh, it might have been from the Festival Express. Oh, so it might not. No, I think it was at Threadgill's because she was friendly with the owner, and he might have run a soundboard. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was Festival Express. That's what the... Oh, no, uh, the, the sound, I, I do believe you're correct uh, that it was. Uh, but uh, I have no idea who the musicians were on it, and I know that the video is not the same. Right, right. That someone just slapped together video images because all they had was audio. Right. They, they could have done a slideshow. Who knows? I mean, if they wanted to, but that's what they chose to put on it. And there was complaints from a bunch of people saying, how come it doesn't line up? Well, you know, it's... Totally different. That's all. That's why. What what I'm doing is I'm going to download it onto DVD because you know YouTube will eventually yank it, and it really is rare. Yeah, yeah. Get that flash recorder going. Yeah. Um, John, what are you still playing on the weekends? I am. I have never stopped playing. So you play relentlessly. Well, it's slowed down the last couple of years. Um, we were we were doing a a house job in London, Ontario for three or four years every Saturday afternoon and it really kept our hands in shape and kept us on top of our game but now it's slowed down a little bit uh, that that uh, house gig is over and um, 
And now I think they're coming by about every three to four weeks, the jobs now. Oh, so you still play around London? It haven't, haven't since those house gigs uh, went, went under. Oh, so there's different venues you play? Yeah, uh, d different venues. There's a couple of, uh, couple of spots here in Stratford, Ontario, where I'm from, and uh, we do play there. And, uh, and, and then there's the, the odd out-of-town thing. But uh, we're not really pursuing it all that strongly these days. Everybody has their own lives and, uh, and their own other things to do. And, but uh, we, we do keep our hand in, and we, uh, if there isn't a, a job for three or four weeks, we definitely get together for an evening or two and run through some tunes. It's just fun. And what's the name of the group? Plum Loco. Say that again? Plum Loco. P-L-U-M? Yeah, P-L-U-M-L-O-C-O. Plum Loco. Yeah, it's uh, what Gabby Hayes called uh, Roy Rogers when he, when he wanted to do something crazy. He says, you're a plum loco. Well, you know what I would love to do? I would love to bring Marty Ballin of the Jefferson Airplane up to your area to do some concerts and have your plum loco open. That'd be great. Because I work with Marty, and uh, we just got him a brand new agency, a big agency to book him worldwide. Hmm. And we're doing the entire Surrealistic Pillow album which is uh, the second Jefferson Airplane album with Somebody to Love, White Rabbit, today. So uh, did you ever play, oh, sure, you played on stage with Marty at Woodstock. Maybe not the same day. Uh, would, that, would that be Woodstock 69 you're talking about? Right, Jefferson Airplane played one of the days. I'm not sure if it was 15, 16, or 17. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I was only there for one day, and, and there was a lot of bands on, so... Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I was sort of focused on our particular show. I, I know that uh, before we went on at Woodstock 69, uh, Credence was playing. I remember watching them uh, from 180 degrees uh, from the front, <laughs> sort of just watching the back of their amps and as, we, as we were setting up. And, and, of course, they rotated the stage, and uh, we started playing, and uh, Credence tore down. You know, what's really strange is Credence wasn't on the original LP. Um, Neither was Janice. Right, but Janice was so larger than life, you always knew Janice and Woodstock. Credence never got the cachet Janice got, even though they both weren't on the live album. The five live albums, uh, Woodstock 1 or 2. Well, I think some of it might have been contractual. I, 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 ah. I don't think they got all their ducks in, in order uh, before the... The concert, and um, I think there was some problems later with uh, with rights, hassling over uh, rights and percentages, or whatever. I, I really don't know, but uh, that was my understanding that some of those performances didn't hit the streets on the original movie, either because the movie the movie would, was going to last 90 minutes probably, and, the, and the, it was uh, three days worth of entertainment. They had to pick and choose what they wanted to put on, but Janice was conspicuously missing from from the whole thing. I, I, uh, I've heard several different um, theories as to why that was, but uh, I'm glad that eventually it did come out. You know, somebody sent me some video of Woodstock anonymously. I don't know who sent it to me, but it was a videotape of three songs from Woodstock from a camera angle that I've never seen before. Nice. It, it, it's really close up. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, but it's never appeared in film that, I, that I've seen. Transfer it to DVD and save it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's right. It's, it's, uh, it's still on the VHS. Always transfer the stuff. You don't want it to deteriorate. I know. The, those, those tapes do, don't they? A good friend of mine um, sent us the German telecast from, I think I sent you a DVD of that. What I think it was 41369 performance in Germany. Um, was that you, or that was might have been Sam, April in 69, right? I didn't play Europe with Janice. Yeah, okay. No. So that was Sam. Right, I came in about halfway through the, um, the Cosmic Blues experience, uh, which lasted approximately one year, a little less than a year. Uh, but uh, to me, that was a great band. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the horns and, and, uh, and the organ, Richard Kermode on organ, and and Snooky on, on baritone, and, and Louis Gask on trump, trumpet, and, um, and Terry Clemens on, on tenor. That, 
that to me was a good band. And uh, I tell you, I stepped into a situation that um, was just a pure joy to play along with because when you play in a band with horns, you have to play a lot less. You, you play a different role. It's sort of somebody coined the term ensemble playing. Sure. Um, it, it, was a, it was a joy to get right in with that because there, there was a piano you had to leave room for and, and you just sort of play am, amongst everybody else. You don't, it's not like a guitar, bass, and drums trio where the guitar has to do everything, you know, like Hendrix or The Cream or something like this. This was a real joy. And... Uh, to hear those uh, those horn parts, like I have a a favorite video that's that's on YouTube right now, and, and uh, uh, it's um, it was from a, a performance that we did um, on NBC. I think it was um, I don't remember the name of the show now, Rocket or something like that. It's hosted by uh, uh, David Steinberg. Oh, I'll have to look it up. Yeah, and we do uh, we do try, and we do. Um, Maybe. She does a tremendous job on Maybe. And there you can really hear the horns and what they can do. It was a enjoyable band. And then, and then when she finally did um, decide to make a change, she turned everybody loose except for me and Brad Campbell, the bass player, who is also uh, another Canadian from down the road here, and um, who I see fairly often. And uh, she retained the two of us to go back to California and form Full Tilt. So uh, I got two different views on uh, on Janice's career in two different bands. Both and, Brad and I did. And, and you and Sam are really the only two people in Brad because uh, Sam was, of course, in Big Brother and then full uh, Cosmic Blues. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, he did play in two bands, right? And uh, and then with Brad and uh, and and I, we did the the other two bands uh, with uh, Cosmic Blues in common. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, um, I look back on those, on those days very fondly about, uh, about all the people I worked with. And uh, if they ever invent a time machine, I'd like to go back. <laughs> well, I was 15, 16 at the time, 17. I would love to go back and, uh, and experience what you people experienced, you know? Right. I, I, when I'm looking... Uh, I look back on things, I, I think, well, you know, it's, uh, this, it was just so fortunate uh, for me to be in, a, in the right place at the right time to be involved in that. Because, uh, and, and another thing is I, I didn't really realize that Woodstock was going to be the, the iconic event that it, it turned out to be. I mean, I had played a, uh, at least one job with Janice, uh, two jobs with Janice before that, and... Uh, they, uh, they were fairly big venues, like it was, um, Forest Hills, and I believe there was a place in Maryland. Uh, that was the first job in Maryland that, that Sam wasn't around. And, um, but the, the, we, we were rehearsing up in Woodstock, New York, and uh, the, the road crew kept coming back from the site going, it's getting bigger, John, it's getting bigger, you won't believe it. And, and I, I, to me, I... If you can't see past the first five rows, it doesn't mean anything whether there's a, a half a million people out there or not. I mean, we played at night, and, and I couldn't really see beyond the first five or ten rows of people standing there. So I was, as far as I was concerned, it, it was just as good as playing to a, a small little in, intimate audience, you know. But um, there was just so much going on that uh, I had to be on my toes. I had to keep track of what key we're going to be in. I had to watch it. Janice for counting the songs in, or whoever was going to be counting, and uh, I, I just had to, to more or less stay on track, and uh, you can only look out of the audience for so long, and then you've got to look back and, and take care of business and do your job, so uh, the, the most important thing to me was that I didn't play anything, play anything drastically wrong, and it, um, it really was uh, the, the third job I had played with Janice, and uh, I really wasn't totally sure of what I was supposed to be doing, but uh, I had practiced a lot on my own and with rehearsals with the band, and I made a lot of notes and uh, tried to keep track of what I had to do. And, um, and I reviewed that constantly up until that point. But, you know, uh, there's something I, I learned over the years is that stage fright, stage fright doesn't set in 
unless you don't feel prepared. And um, I, I didn't have stage fright at, at, at Woodstock uh, because um, I figured I, I would I would go with my experience and uh, what I had managed to assume, and, and I just hoped everything came, went for the best, came off for the best, and then I just had fun. And I just uh, did what I'd always tried to do, which is play well. So, um, and, and in retrospect, I guess it was okay, you know. I'm holding up the poster from the Woodstock experience with uh, people August 15th to 18th, 1969. And then there's a nice picture of Janice, uh, beautiful red picture of Janice on the poster. Uh, I hope Sony sent you the Pearl Deluxe with the uh, bonus disc. I, I believe they did, yes. That's got Festival Express music on it, which is tremendous to have a full live album, um, unlike the um, Janis Joplin in concert, which had half of Big Brother and half of Full Tilt. Uh -huh. This is a, a full tilt, full tilt boogie live album, which is in the Pearl Deluxe. It's called. Oh yeah, they're taken from some uh, live shows, are they? Yeah, Tell Mama, Half Moon, Move Over, Maybe, Summertime, Little Girl Blue. Mm. Um, well, uh, just to interrupt you for a second, there was some songs that Janice carried through various bands. Right. And then others, others she dropped. Like one that was retained all the way through was "Peace of My Heart." I, she did that with Big Brother. She did that with the the, the following two bands too. And uh, but then others, like say uh, maybe now, maybe Jerry Ragaboy's maybe that was done with Cosmic Blues, and she carried through that to full tilt. And uh, but then then there was others that she didn't do with full tilt, like. Um, well, there was one, um, Try was another one that she, uh, she started doing in uh, Cosmic Blues and then carried through to Full Tilt. But Get It While You Can, that was one that was brand new to Full Tilt. And uh, speaking of Jerry Ragaboy, I was amazed when I took a, a closer look at his writing credits. Oh, yeah. That there was, uh, Janice did no less than five of his songs. She loved Ragavoy. Mm hmm And uh, Ragavoy just passed away, unfortunately, a month ago. Yeah. But yeah, I wish I'd have met him. Did you meet Chip Taylor, who co-wrote Try? No, I didn't. Chip Taylor wrote Wild Thing. So pairing up Chip Taylor and Jerry Ragavoy is really unique. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wild Thing. Yeah. Uh, he also wrote Angel of the Morning from Merrily Rush. Right. Yeah. Well, it, um, the, it still is so vivid in my mind, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the moments of, of Woodstock. I remember uh, it, it's, uh, I could be right back there right now in my mind in some of, the, some of these situations that we're in. And, you know, that seems to be how uh, our memory works, is that uh, we can't remember every single second of what went by. But there are those moments that are absolutely vivid, and you can be right back there again, so without any doubt that that's the way it really was. And um, I look back very fondly on those Woodstock days. I, I really like the, the photographs, of the overhead photographs of the site. And, and um, I, I did get—I got a chance to go back to uh, to Woodstock for uh, the Woodstock '94 concert with Aerosmith. Uh, well, I, I, I was on the, I went to the secondary stage and caught the band and, um, and uh, Primus. And, um, but in both, both situations, I never got to go out into the audience. Huh. With the, uh, I, I got to go in through, uh, be, be es escorted in, in the backstage area at Woodstock 94. But I was told, uh, don't go out into the audience because I didn't actually have a physical pass. So uh, I might not have gotten back to get back on the bus again. So I didn't go out then. And then John Cook gave us strict orders when we were at Woodstock 69 that nobody goes out into the audience because we want to make sure we have a band when it comes time to go on. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that could, have very been, could quite have been very possible that we couldn't have gotten back in. 
there's quite a quite the, uh, the organized confusion there. You know, Genya Raven uh, did Jerry Ragavoy Stay With Me, and 10-wheel drive, not 10 years after, but 10-wheel drive was so uh, up and coming and, and hot that they refused to play Woodstock, which was a big mistake, of course. Hmm. And Tommy James and the Shondells, same thing. They thought they, you know, it would have helped both. Tommy was, you know, Tommy's been a guest on the show frequently. Uh, he's a great guy. But uh, it, it would have been great for Tommy James and for uh, Genya Raven, 10-wheel drive, to be on the bill, too. Right. I, I think the world lost out because Genya is such a great voice, but she, she's some, something like Janice. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Who is it? Genya Raven. No. Genya Raven and 10-wheel drive. They were, they were very hot on Polydor, but they turned down Woodstock because they, were, they felt they didn't need it, and um, it would have changed history for them. Well, yeah, <clears throat> you, you just never know, do you? No. But we were supposed to play Altamont, at ah. least offered to us. And um, there were several reasons why we didn't end up going to California. We were already on the East Coast. <clears throat> it, it wouldn't have been log logistically possible to get our equipment back out there. And plus, there, there was some, some concern uh, among the, uh, the management as to whether it would be really such a good idea <coughs> for us to go out there. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, in retrospect, it turned out to be quite a uh, unorganized bedlam. And uh, people said after the fact that it's good we didn't go. But still, it wouldn't have been good for us to not have gone to Woodstock. Right. So you never know. They were both build big concerts and... Uh, but there was always the potential for uh, for Altamont to be uh, even bigger than Woodstock, but it it didn't turn out that way. Just lucky. Now I'm holding in my hand a 1973 book by Myra Friedman, the biography of Janis Joplin, buried alive. Myra, yeah. And I love Myra. She's um, she's no longer with us. She died uh, last October, and uh, but <clears throat> like like several people in in my life. I've just managed to uh, to see them one last time, and uh, I don't know if it's some kind of providence, but uh, <clears throat> that that happened with Richard Commode too. We we took uh, with Richard Commode did the piano pair with uh, with Cosmic Blues. Okay. We um, we lived together in, in San Francisco. Uh, my wife and I, Dor Dorcas, uh, my wife and I, <clears throat> and Richard, we got an apartment, uh, a two bedroom apartment, and we, we split the rent. And we lived there. This was after, after Cosmic Blues was disbanded. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, we we remained friends, and uh, we lived together for uh, for the longest time. Well, well, Full Tilt was uh, was being formed, and I was still living with Richard uh, on on Sutter Street in San Francisco. And um, it, it we lost we lost track of each other for uh, for many decades after that. And, but but in uh, around 93, 92, 93, we took a trip down the Coast Highway in California. And uh, before we left San Francisco, we got to see Richard again one last time. And it was, uh, it was one, of those, one of those crazy things where, uh, how am I ever going to reach this guy? And I, I went into a bar and uh, he said, well, I don't, we don't know. Uh, ask the sax player. Maybe he does. And the sax player... He almost dropped the saxophone on the floor when I asked, him, did anybody know where Richard Commode is? And so we managed to get together with Richard, and uh, <clears throat> it wasn't but a few months after that that Richard left us, and he was gone. So I really feel fortunate that uh, we got to be reunited that one last time with Richard Commode. And then um, same thing with Myra. Uh, uh, we, were, we were buddies on the telephone for, for decades sort of lost track of her uh, initially, but then we got to uh, talking maybe once a week on the phone, and we just yak and laugh, and uh, she'd come up with the latest news or latest opinions, and uh, and she said, when are you coming to, to, to New York, John? I said, well, I'm going to get there eventually. She said, yeah, right. But I did go. I did go uh, two years ago. I drove into Manhattan. I remember. We were in touch back then. That's right, yes. And... Um, she had an apartment on 14th Street, and and uh, I, I, I 
paid the ten dollars an hour to park. It was really worth it to see Myra, and uh, uh, it was uh, Manhattan hadn't changed. It was just as crazy on the on the streets as it was back in 1969. I don't think it was even more any more crazy because the cars were bumper to bumper and three lanes wide and, and trying to fit into two lanes back then. But uh, it was the same thing. And anyway, I got to uh, got to see Myra and we took a few photos and uh, she she. Uh, she was always uh, she was just so up and happy and grinning and smiling and uh, so I did finally get to see her and then uh, a year later she passed away so in a way I, I in some strange way I feel fortunate that we got to be united at least once before uh, it was too late. Um, now she was Albert Grossman's um, publicist and worked for Janice. <clears throat> yeah, she worked out of Grossman Glatzer uh, management and. Uh, it was on uh, the third or fourth floor up on, uh, I think it was 42nd Street, something. And I'm um, not sure of the exact address. But, yeah, that's where we met. And, uh, and every time we'd pull in from the, from the West Coast for a tour to, to play on the East Coast, whether it was with Full Tilt or whether it was with Cosmic Blues, Myra would be there and she'd meet Janice and they'd go off and they'd do girl things. And, and um, she just sort of... Just some company, and and, uh, and also uh, they discuss the latest promotions and whatever. They they they, they talk shop and do business and, and and just sort of hang around. So she was a she she knew a lot about the way Janice's mind worked and uh, and what Janice's wants and desires and and hopes and dreams were. And uh, uh, Janice uh, Myra had a lot of history in. Uh, that a lot of history that she never actually wrote, and uh, it's really a shame now because uh, a lot of that is gone. Of Myra's gone. Yeah, that is sad. Yeah. Have you read Laura Joplin's book? Um, Love no, Janice. Uh, I, I haven't. No. There's Love Janice, and then there's a, a book called Scars of Sweet Paradise, and there's a book by David Dalton that came out originally, Janice. Way back when. Yeah, I remember David. He so traveled he, with us uh, with Full Tilt for a week or so and did an article in Rolling Stone. Uh, oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, he recently did Steven Tyler's biography. He worked with Marianne Faithful. He's done a lot, Meatloaf. He's done a lot of the bios. Mm hmm. Mm. Have you thought of writing your his, you know, history and put it in book form? Your life story. That would be, that, I'd have to be organized to do that. <laughs> yeah, but you could take the allmusic.com bio that we worked on together, and that could be a good template, right? You just expand it. Yeah, I could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, uh, maybe someday I'll have to find the time to do it. So, uh, there, there never seems to, there, there always, there never seems to be enough time to do everything you want to do, you know? And, uh, but that would be something that would be a lot of fun to do. Yes, especially if you have the pictures, like you said, those pictures of, and, and the footage from Woodstock from that camera angle, you could take photo slides from that and put them in the book. Right, yeah, I never, I never found out where those came from. It's just an, an anonymous VHS tape with three songs on it, and sent from England. Oh, you just say, thank you to Mr. Anonymous or Ms., Mr. or Ms. Anonymous from England. I could do that. Somehow they had my address, I don't know, uh, but... Uh, it, it was a lot of fun to, to see that. I said, "Wow!" Because every other Woodstock thing, I was sort of trying to trying to keep keep a low profile during the whole Woodstock thing because um, I, I was still trying to fit into that band, you know. And uh, I wasn't leaping to the front of the stage and doing somersaults or anything like that. Not that I ever did do anything like that. But uh, any any video you, uh, you see of Woodstock, I'm always way off in the distance, back by the piano. Oh. And uh, just sort of keeping an eye on what Richard Camoe was doing, and uh, so it uh, it was a big surprise that these uh, these camera shots, uh, this video came up that like it, I'm full screen, you know, and, and uh, so some somebody uh, had another camera going that I, I don't know if it's ever appeared on on, on film or ever appeared on on a, on a movie or video at all. That's fascinating. So. Uh in the early days, 
Um, how did the Joplin band find you? How did the did, did uh, Albert Grossman look for you or John Cook? Well, I happened to be playing for Ronnie Hawkins, who was uh, the previous frontman for the band. Uh, the band, you know, Levon Helm, um, uh, Robbie Robertson, Rick Danko, Guy absolutely, um, Richard Manuel. They uh, uh, they they were Ronnie's band, the Hawks. And uh, he needed a new band because they left him. And uh, I, I found my way to the Hawks Nest in Toronto and uh, got, uh, got working with Ronnie. Uh, various incarnations of the Hawks over the years. It was like about three or four years I worked with Ronnie. And then um, uh, it, it was right on Young Street. It was a good. So some people said, John, what was it like back in the days of the. Peace, love, and the, the, the summer of uh, the summer of love, and all that. I said that was really wonderful. I, I I would love to go back, but I said, you know, where I'd actually like to go back is just a little bit before that, to Young Street in 1968, playing for Ronnie on Young Street at the Lecoq Door Tavern. Now that was a good time. That that, that was some learning years where uh, you know, people. People wore black suits and ties and drank rye and cokes. You know, it wasn't any tie dyes and and, and starry glasses and, and uh, uh, strange smelling smoke. It, it was it was back. It, it was uh, it was rock and roll time back then. It, it was uh, Young Street was a lot of fun. And and I, I told Ronnie that I said if I had my druthers, I'd like to go back there. And um, Ronnie worked us hard, but. Uh, it, in retrospect, we learned. We learned for, and, and we got strength from that. And uh, so, I was playing for Ronnie at a concert at Varsity Stadium in 1969. And um, I, I was uh, the, the night before the concert, the band had played uh, at Varsity Stadium, and they came out to the, the bar out in Streetsville, where where I was playing with Ronnie, and. Uh, we had a little bit of a jam session. Levon was on stage, and, and Rick Danko, and, and John Simon, the, who produced uh, the Big Pink, and, and also had something to do with uh, Janice's uh, oh, cheap thrills. Yeah. John's a wonderful guy. The piano player, yeah, a great guy. And uh, uh, we we had a bit of a jam session, and then uh, next day I was approached uh, by Albert if uh, if I would like to come and work with Janice, and uh, and I, I thought about it for about. Uh, like, I really didn't know Janice. I didn't know who she was, or, or but I, I figured, well, maybe it's time to make a move. I, 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 um, I got some advice on it that, should, should I do it? Should I? And several people said, oh, yeah, John, you should do it. So um, I, did, I decided to, um, to, to, to take a jump at things, and uh, I gave Ronnie my notice and, and went to the States, and uh, it, was a, it was a good move, for sure. And um, like right, Ronnie and I, uh, we've always we've remained friends. Uh, we played, uh, we opened for Ronnie uh, a couple of years ago in Stratford here at a concert in the park. Ronnie Hawkins and friends, and we, we played, uh, we've opened for Ronnie also at uh, the Stratford Shakespearean Festival. There was uh, several concerts there, and um, so over the years we've uh, we've gotten together, but. Uh, I, I felt at the time that it was a it was something I, I should do, even though I wasn't really sure uh, what about the situation with Janice. The minute I got down and I down to the states, the very first day I arrived, um, uh, actually the next day I, they, they took me out to New Haven, Connecticut, where she was playing um, at uh, the I think it was Yale, and um, they sat me down in front of the stage and, and I watched. A tremendous performance by Janice and uh, and Cosmic Blues, and she had changed a lot since um, since the Monterey Pop film. Uh, she was dressing differently, she was moving differently, she had a different band. I tell you, I was I was I was uh, hypnotized because she was working the stage and, and the, the band sounded so good. The horns, I I said I I knew that this was going to be a lot of fun, and then uh, that was the only time I actually got to sit out and watch Cosmic Blues was that one one evening. Even. But then after that, it was uh, 
constant um, constant rehearsal and and, uh, and travel. That's very cool. Now, do, did you record with Ronnie Hawkins? Yes, I did. I did. Uh, there, there was an album uh, we recorded at Arc Studios. That, uh, some tunes that uh, that some some people might remember. Home from the Forest was one I was on, um, and uh, he did some tunes. Uh, I think some Gordy Lightfoot tunes on that. Uh, another Torontonian. Uh, sure. On that album, and uh, yeah, there was uh, there was three or four t other songs. There, Another person who was on that album was uh, King Biscuit Boy, Richard Newell, ah. who uh, who died a few years back too. But what a tremendous blues harmonica player Richard Newell was. And we worked together for the longest time, and then Richard Newell came south uh, to Woodstock, and we actually did a uh, a tour with Richard with uh, Full Tilt Boogie after Janice died. So uh, there's some more stuff to be heard out there that hasn't been released yet. Oh, that's that's uh, good to hear. Wow. Did you ever do videotapes back in the day? I know that was more... Um, no, no, uh, no, no. Not video, but uh, you know what I mean. Uh, if it was ever taped uh, for TV or anything. Well, the only thing that, that was going in those days was uh, sound, soundless film. That ah. Cook took a lot of that. Oh, uh, that's that's where a lot of this uh, this archival film comes from. Is John always had his eight millimeter silent film going all the time, and uh, you'd turn around and there <laughs> there wouldn't be John's face. There'd be a camera instead. But it's good that he did that, and uh, he'd he'd have that thing fired up uh, on the way to the airport. He'd have it, and uh, he must have hours and hours and hours of silent film of of Janice in uh, in both bands in Cosmic Blues and. Uh, Oh, that's good to know. I was actually asking about Ronnie Hawkins, if anyone filmed that, even silent. There is. Ah. CBC did one show, um, and uh, there's some archival uh, video. Yeah, it's actual videotape. It's not film. And uh, they came in, and uh, it was when I was in the band, and it was really interesting to see. You know? uh, they actually they did a show. It was a... Um, a half-hour show of which there was a 15-minute segment uh, uh, that featured Ronnie, and uh, and it was edited. There was some off-stage stuff as well as some on-stage stuff, but it was really fun to see, and that exists. Oh, that's great to know. You know, it'd be great to see John Cook's stuff to come out too, or if he should do a documentary or some kind of na narrate over it. You know. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. I mean, this stuff. Uh, I know that the CBC stuff has been converted to DVD, and you can purchase it, but uh, it's not out there being advertised or for sale. But uh, they've got the CBC; they do it for money, right? And so, uh, unless it's for personal use, uh, if it's going to be involved in any production, then uh, then there's going to have to be other considerations for the CBC archives. And they're like uh, they're like PBS. For Canada? Well, yeah, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. They're actually a, a, a government, uh, government funded and sponsored. Uh, ah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's government. But. Uh, so the CBC did Ronnie Hawkins, and John Cook taped uh, you and Janice uh, with 8mm or something. Well, John Cook uh, taped Janice. Right. Yeah, he taped a lot of hers. Now I don't know about the sound from those days. I mean, this probably stuff does exist. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced that that whole Varsity Stadium concert did not go unrecorded, but I've never heard anything from it. But maybe it did get unrecorded. I don't know. Now a friend of mine's doing a Beatles movie, and he's taken archival footage and fan audio and fan video, and he spent a fortune painstakingly making videos of the Beatles that never existed. Oh yeah. And I sat in his office, and I'm watching this. I'm like, my God, this is amazing. So he, he might have like a fan eight millimeter from, of half a song and then a quarter of a song. And there might not be anything in the middle, but he's got the whole audio. So he'll pan a photograph of John Lennon, and, and the camera will go right to left very slowly. Then, boom, the footage starts up again. It's fascinating. Hmm. 
so he actually has a full video of the Beatles on stage that never existed. Wow. And he's doing that. He's been doing this movie for years because he, my friend Bobby Hebb, you know Bobby wrote Sonny? Yeah, one of my favorite songs. And we lost Bobby last August 3rd. Oh. Wow. I don't know if you know that. No, I did not. A year ago this August, we lost Bobby. It was a terrible thing that happened, but you know, I mean, he was, he had health issues. But for me personally, it was awful. Um, so Bobby had toured with the Beatles in 66. And this friend of mine, who's a videographer, and um, he does a lot of media stuff, his parents wouldn't let him go. And so he is making this movie about not being able to go to the Beatles, so he wants to piece together the legacy. And he's got fascinating news footage and things that people thought were gone forever. He has painstakingly searched the world for our footage, and it's amazing what he's coming up with. That's wonderful. I mean, sometimes things happen for a reason. That, that film wouldn't have existed if you went to the show, probably. Exactly. So what I'm saying is it's, it's something similar with you and your work must be out there because people always had those cameras rolling or audio rolling. Right. Well, in those days, uh, if there was any reel-to-reels going, it would have happened uh, off the board. Uh, uh, somebody would have had to, somebody would have been questioned uh, as to whether they have the uh, authority to, to record the performances. But, uh, and, and cassettes, they weren't very, very, uh, audio cassettes, they were around. Uh, that's when I first got into sound recording was I bought a, an audio cassette back uh, just before I went to the States in 69. So uh, uh, there, uh, there was, really wasn't that much going on. I mean, uh, th there might be some stuff out there. It would be so nice if somehow there could be some sort of exchange, you know, where you could, you could uh, report that, yes, you have this tape and, uh, and, and some sort of... Uh, consideration being given to the people who took the chance and, and, and actually made the recordings and uh, and but to bring that stuff out but because I know there's probably a lot of stuff in people's basements or maybe just in the landfill now you know uh, that that could have been uh, but it could have provided a lot of enjoyment but it, whatever is still out there I wish somehow I could find a way to surface and was so that we could hear that that stuff well, maybe my friend's film will inspire it. John, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, do we have, um, oh, my director just came in, but we only have a couple of minutes left. I'd love to have you back if, if you have more to talk about, you know, when, in a couple of weeks if you'd like. Well, you can't shut me up once you get me going, you know that. Yeah, I, you know, I hope you had fun. This, this has been fascinating. I, I've got a lot more questions, but... Um, uh, I appreciate that we've been able to discuss Woodstock. It was uh, 42 years ago, and 43 years ago was the final Harvard Square concert, August 12th. Mm -hmm. And you ended your tour with Janice up here in Boston in the Cambridge uh, Harvard Stadium. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we could talk about that next time, if you'd like. Well, I, I pretty well all I remember was that little anecdote I emailed to you. Uh, it, we were uh, we were fairly busy with what we had to do, you know. But uh, like like I said before, these little snippets of memory come back, and uh, they're quite vivid to me. I can still hear the crowd hollering as we opened the door and threw the cans of beer up at them. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, we didn't know it would be the last one, Joe. But um, we didn't know that maybe three months later she would be no more. But uh, it, it was a wonderful time while it lasted, and um, I'm glad some people still have an interest in it because it really was a great moment in history. I think you're a fantastic guitar player. I think you are underrated. I think Cosmic Blues Band was underrated. And I have so many more questions. I'd love to chat with you again, John. Well, I'd love to chat with you too, Joe, and uh, I, I thank everyone for, uh, for having an interest in listening in if they're there. And, uh, and, uh, Say hi to a few of my uh, friends from Boston, uh, Krista Rose. I'm, I don't know if she's listening, but hi, Krista, and, uh, and, uh, and Billy from Boston. And uh, we'll uh, maybe get together another time. Sounds great, man. Thanks so much. Okay, Joe. You take care. You too, John. Bye-bye. Bye. John Till on the anniversary of the 42nd anniversary of Woodstock.
And uh, you know it's that time, people. <laughs>